Good morning, this is Dr. Garayas. It is Thursday, June 25, and this is MED 260 Exams and Special Procedures. And a uh, public service announcement for today is make sure to go into your announcement, Zoom session, extra videos, extra notes section. Um, on, and then once you click on that, you end up here. Please take a look at the laboratory schedule. And I need an email back as soon as possible. Uh, let's let's open this um, because uh, we're at the uh, phase two already in the lovely Commonwealth of Virginia and that means we can partially go back to campus now um, that means for laboratories but I need a he I need a definitive headcount uh, so uh, you have to like RSVP uh, on your lab so if you open up the laboratory schedule and uh, you can see here, you could uh, find your class, MAD 26070X, there's only three of you. And what are we gonna be doing in these laboratories? The next uh, part here, uh, history taking, physical examination, urinalysis, and that's for session one, and uh, uh, eye and ear care, and uh, pediatrics, heights and measurements, and um, and, and uh, also a quick review over, uh, and that's in physical examination, quick review over vital signs and uh, some physical therapy modalities. So if you cannot make these dates, and if you look further down and you look for your class, MED uh, 260, July 9th, um, that's a morning session. And I could also make it an afternoon session if you can't make the morning or um, a, I'm also doing an extra uh, Saturday for those who can't make it. So uh, kindly send me an email to confirm that you're coming in July 9th, 2020, and that's uh, week seven, that's next week. And, or well, uh, week seven, that's like two weeks from now. And then uh, you look, MED 260, July 17th, and it's a Friday morning session uh and the sessions start at 10 a.m now if you can't make these two sessions please give me a call and if you can make these sessions i need an email as well because um i have to do a head count so that we don't have too many people on campus uh at any one time and remember uh nursing is also going to be on campus uh uh around that time and so is culinary so we're and culinary's got a lot of people Nursing has a decent amount of people as well. So we're trying to coordinate so that, again, not too many people. And when you come in, uh, there'll be masks provided, uh, but you should come in if you got your scrubs, wear them. Uh, and um, you'll be also provided like a, uh, and if you got your lab coat, wear it. But uh, we also have uh, disposable uh, lab gowns as well. We're pretty much gonna treat it like surgery. You're gonna come in, uh, try not to bring too many material, like maybe just your bag and uh, um, you're gonna leave your bag and all your private material uh, to one side of the room. Uh, we'll not touch it for the duration. And then we, uh, we scrub in and then we glove up and we mask up just like surgery. And then we go in, we go do uh, what we need to do and um, have sign-in sheets and check-off sheets of the skill sets that you did. And then we move on with our day. So it's, even though it says morning session from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., evening session from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, it's depending. Uh, I'll stay there till the duration, but if we can get done what we need to get done uh, in an hour, hour and a half, so be it. Um, because again, uh, the university does not want us to stay on campus for an extended period of time. And also, as another side note, if you have any issues with coming to campus uh, at this time, or if you have high-risk family members uh, in your home, uh, please relay that to me and uh, you and I can have uh, uh, maybe a, um, a different session, uh, maybe a one on one. Uh, and I'm trying to get permission to get uh, like a one on one, maybe set up a tent outside so that um, uh, there'll be even more, uh, uh, even less contact. Uh, but I, I have some options, but so far only one person uh, thus far uh, emailed me back stating that they have a high-risk person at home. And uh, that particular person is still coming to laboratory, but 
we're going to do a one-on-one -on -one session instead of being in a class. And if you're coming into a class, we're not allowing more than five or six people at a time so that uh, we can abide by the CDC guidelines uh, for social distancing and, and also just to, in general, keep everyone safe. So um, that's the first public service announcement. That was a mouthful. The second one is registration is now open. So make sure to get to your academic advisor. And I believe all of you guys are medical assistants. So I believe your advisor is either uh, Professor Jones or Dr. Nua. Uh, so whoever that may be, uh, get to them if you don't know what classes to pick and um, register as soon as possible. So that, you know, get that out of the way so you're ready for the next term. So that was uh, the lab stuff and uh, the public service announcements for today. So what are we doing today? What's going on here? Just trying to clear this and then go back to the class. All right, again, it's week five. So what's due today, week four stuff. So week four or topic four stuff. If you haven't done your discussion, do it by today right or every day you don't do it by it's uh minus 10 percent uh and of course um perform your uh online quiz four and remember uh your first performance is due the week of but if you want to uh, i see some of you have like 60s and 70s on your quizzes retake it and get a hundred okay because the, the purpose of uh, my quizzes is you know for training so it'll, it'll get you going now, um, last week we did um, uh, obstetrics and urology, and uh, I forgot to mention, uh, watch this um, video here of Nageli's rule. It's a quick, nowadays they got these little fancy apps and they have these little, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? These cards uh, that have dates on it. And uh, from your last menstrual period, you can figure out um uh the edc or expected date of confinement and that's the day that most likely at a 40 week age of gestation uh mommy is due okay so that's uh, uh i forgot to mention that video uh last time so take a look at that video that's nice i also chucked in there surgical instruments uh nice review for your surgical instruments if you don't remember them from your med 140 class and we'll be also going through some um, uh, quick review in laboratory, uh, some of the instruments, how to handle them, and of course, uh, sanitization, disinfection, and sterilization processes for these surgical instruments when we get to lab. So this year, not this year, this week, week five, of course, you got discussion five, uh, you have quiz five, and you'll notice that the quiz five is a Microsoft Word document so I'm gonna need, yeah, you print it out, or not print it out, you open it up and then answer it and then copy and paste uh, your answers onto a, um, onto a uh, uh, you know, email and then uh, get an email confirmation that I received your quiz, all right? Now, uh, grades are due this Saturday, so please uh, get as many grades in, um, uh, but, Essentially, your midterm grade is just um, an estimate of where you are uh, in the class, okay? It's not an official grade yet. So if you're not doing so hot or your grade is a little bit subpar uh, than you're used to, then you have five weeks to uh, improve your grade. Or give me a call. I'm okay with doing uh, extra tutoring and or uh, extra assignments to boost your grade. I'm good with it. So. As long as you're willing to do the work, I'm, I'm willing to look at it and grade it. So let's look at um, ophthalmology and ENT. And I put some notes here. So you could look at, open them up. You could uh, look over those. And it has, and you could see, it has a, a nice little, you know, right? What you need to know uh, about, uh, the class and I actually copied and pasted these are one of my better notes I actually copied and pasted uh, items uh, from uh, your chapter and again ignore the page numbers uh, it's the correct chapter but it's uh, it might be from a different um, 
edition of your uh, of your current uh, textbook. So before we begin, uh, let's let's look over the case of Valerie Ramirez and Chapter Forty Three, and let's look at what is up. Why is my computer not cooperating? There you go. So I look up the textbook and remember, I believe it, remember it was like the pink one or the, I don't know what color this is, red. So I'm going in here and I'm looking at chapter 43. And let's look at the case. Table of contents. Then when you go to table of contents, um, here, unit six, and scroll down, chapter 43, assisting with eye and ear care. And of course, if you're assist assisting with eye care, you're in the department of uh, ophthalmology, and ear care, you're probably in the department of otorhinolaryngology, also known as ENT. So let's look at Ms. Valerie Ramirez. What page is this, 611? What does my notes say? Yeah, see, page 532. So it's not, the page numbers aren't accurate, but the chapter, of course, is accurate. It's based on a, um, uh, a previous edition of this book. Because I've been teaching this for quite a while. So let's look at Ms. Valerie Ramirez, 33-year-old female. And remember, they left out their occupation. But when you're looking at cases and real cases, uh, let's make up an occupation for, uh, uh, let's say, um, works at the Department of Motor Vehicle, right? Has been examined by the physician and her chief complaint was something flew into her eye uh, and because she rides her motorcycle every day and maybe she had one of those open face helmets, really not a good idea. Uh, I've been riding motorcycles since I was 16. Uh, really not good idea having your eyes open uh, because you know, there's bugs, there's stuff flying around and uh, your eyes need to be protected. So they had um, the ophthalmologist most likely, right? Probably saw the patient, an outpatient, right? Examined the eye and determined that there is a small amount of debris in her eye. Then uh, um, the first thing we're gonna try is uh, eye irrigation, okay? And we're gonna see that uh, later, in the, uh, later in the chapter at the very end where we look at procedures. So when we look at her, we have to note uh, she's allergic to penicillin. Her vital signs are good, right? Um, five foot two, one thirty-five. Class. She has. She's a little bit overweight. She's uh, uh, not quite obese, but she's heading towards class one, right? So these things you also have to consider because there could be other uh, mitigating circumstances. But uh, you could see here, um, uh, since she's a, she rides a motorcycle versus a car, and she's uh, uh, on the younger side, she has an increased uh, propensity towards uh, trauma, right? Uh, auto accidents or stuff like what's happening now, um, a foreign, a foreign body uh, now in her eye. And it's probably not a simple thing because, um, um, you know, uh, typically, you know, you just wash your eye out or blink a couple of times and whatever is in there should come out. But if it won't come out, uh, the first thing we got to do is try to irrigate it. So this is the Department of Ophthalmology. And um, you can read this part and also go over the disorders of the uh, external eye, right? Uh, and um, they're very common. Right, blepharitis, chronic inflammation, that means it's over a long period of time. Ptosis is, you know when somebody looks sleepy, but they're not? You know when their upper eyelid starts drooping? It either could be unilateral or bilateral, but it could also be a sign and symptom of uh, a neurologic problem. Uh, a sty is also called a hordeolum, right? And um, sometimes, you know, uh, especially like me, I got like, a, I got really long eyelashes and uh, they uh, sometimes they like curl back and then it could form, uh, form a little bit of an infection. 
And if you look at your eyelids, they're part of your skin. And the major bacteria that's on your skin in large amounts is um, uh, uh, is staph or staphylococcus, right? Staph epidermidis and staph aureus, right? But again, there's no such thing as good or bad bacteria, just bacteria in the wrong pace. So if you have a little bit of trauma of an eyelash uh, that got ripped out or got inverted in, and then you have some of that staph go inside, it's not a good thing. Uh, conjunctivitis, pink eye. Remember, uh, uh, pink eye could be allergic, but it could also be infectious. If it's the infectious type, a um, uh, lot of hand washing, be careful because the patient's rubbing it with their hands and then they shake your hand or touch the door and um, it, it's a point source of infection and it's very infectious, okay? And as with Valerie, our patient, uh, she has a, a propensity now that she's uh, riding around her motorcycle without a helmet. I mean, not she, she has a helmet, but it's an open face helmet. Uh, she could have a corneal ulcer, corneal abrasion of things and injuries and trauma that might affect her eye. Okay. Cataracts is when you get a little bit older because um, um, the lens of your eye is supposed to be clear. But as you get older, um, uh, that lens gets scratched up and gets uh, cloudy and uh, and of course obviously causes uh, uh, some vision problems and here is a, a, a cataract you see this lens is supposed to be clear you're supposed to be able to see right through your pupil but you got that cloudiness in there so we can do surgery and remove that now glaucoma is one of the major causes of blindness your eye, if you recall your anatomy and physiology, there's fluid in there and the fluid is under a certain amount of pressure. Now, if that fluid pressure starts building up over time, uh, um, it could uh, mess with not only uh, your blood supply, the capillaries, it also can mess with the nerves in there. Because remember, if you mess with, um, what do you call that? If you, if you mess with um, an organ's blood supply, you're gonna mess with an organ and your eye is connected to your retina, and uh, your retina is just one big nerve. And remember, you don't feed the nerve, the nerve won't uh, work right. Uveitis, like the name states, inflammation or infection. Now, I'm going through these pretty fast, so uh, make sure when you get home, uh, uh, look at them, especially the ones that I point special attention to, like glaucoma. Retinal detachment, like I stated earlier, if you remove or break or cut a nerve, you, will no, you can no longer use that nerve. It, you can't glue it back together. And your retina is no different. Your retina is considered nervous tissue. It is, uh, it's connected to um, uh, your uh, cranial nerve. And if that gets removed for whatever reason, um, it, blindness will occur. Now, this, let's slow down here. Let's look at diabetic retinopathy. That's very, very important. Uncontrolled diabetes is one of those all of the above diseases or disorders, right? Um, if you have uncontrolled diabetes, you have sugar floating all over the place. And one of the, one of the side effects of this sugar is it causes damage to your retina because the sugar should be inside the cell. It shouldn't be floating around causing damage. And you may have heard the analogy that I've already used is, um, it's like, you know when you go to the gas station, you pump gas, right? The gas is supposed to be inside the gas tank. So if you think the gas is like glucose, right? It's supposed to be inside the cell. It's not supposed to be floating around. So if you're at the gas station and you take out the gas pump and you start spraying, you know, the seats and the hood and the roof of your car with gasoline, that's a bad situation. And it's the same thing with diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. It's almost like clockwork. Uh, uncontrolled diabetic will have uh, um, serious uh, eye issues, including, um, including blindness uh, within 10 years of, um, diagnosis of, of, 
of uh, uncontrolled diabetes. My father, uh, when he was alive, within nine years of his diagnosis of diabetes, he already was already uh, declared legally blind. And, and because he didn't, he refused to deal with it and didn't follow the regimen. So uh, he paid for it dearly. Um, ma uh, macular degeneration and uh, da, 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 eh, macular degeneration. It's one of those things that, uh, one of those things of aging, because remember the eye and the human body is a machine and it breaks down and the macula densa is uh, a part of your uh, retina that is, um, it's, it's a good chunk of your visual field. So of course you're gonna start having um, some vision problems when you get older. But macular degeneration is serious. So what happens when you need glasses and things of that matter? And that's the reason why we take, uh, you know, when you go to the doctor's office and in lab, we show you how to do uh, an eye test. Now, the reason why we make you stand 20 feet from that eye chart, also known as a Snellen's chart. Let me see, let me move this thing out of my it's bothering me. Um, this chart. You know, the eye chart that has, you know, all the letters, E, and then we ask the patient at 20 feet to read. And um, if they get to a certain level, right, um, I think it's this one, but we'll see in lab, right? If the patient can successfully read at 20 feet uh, this level, the patient's vision is considered 20-20. That means they can read that particular line at 20 feet and they're good. But if it's less than that, then they have a problem. If it's more than that, then it's good that the patient can really, really see uh, very well. Now, what happens when you get older? Normally when you're young, right, everything works and everything's clear so that when you look at something, you look at the, um, uh, hold up, I gotta change rooms. Uh, I'm learning a load of laundry and it's a little loud. So when you look at um, this chart here, you could see how um, in normal vision, I mean, oopsies. Excuse me. The challenges of, uh, of uh, I didn't, uh, I totally forgot I started a load of laundry. Okay, so when you look at this, right? Emetropia is normal vision. If you see this, all the rays of all the light rays, which are represented by these uh, light blue bars, they go through uh, the pupil, they go through your lens, which is this thing right here. They go through the cornea and everything's all clear so that the image itself lands right on the retina, right here in the back, right? But when you have uh, farsightedness or nearsightedness, either through um, uh, maybe, um, you know, either because of old age or, you know, just genetics, it just happens that sometimes your uh, eyeball is uh, uh, misshapen and that's called um, astigmatism. So you could see here in farsightedness, also known as hyperopia, right? the light rays, they don't meet or converge at the, um, uh, uh, at, the, at the retina. So then my patient is farsighted, right? Now, if my patient was nearsighted or myopic, you could see how the image falls short. It's supposed to be here, but the image kind of lands here. And that's the reason why things look blurry to either a far-sighted uh, person or an, uh, when they try to read or a nearsighted person when they try to look at a sign, you know, 50 meters, 100 meters away. Now, how do we correct it? You, of course, have, uh, you know, glasses or contacts that will change or refract the light, wa light waves and it'll kind of force the light waves right onto the retina. And that's what we're doing when you make the patient, you know, sit in the chair and they look at uh, the different letters. And then when they're measuring you for glasses, um, uh, the ophthalmologist will ask, oh, 
is it um, uh, is it better or is it worse? Better is it worse? And they keep on going through each one for each eye. And remember, you look at each eye separately. Okay. Review your also your abbreviations in your medical terminology regarding um, 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 vision and regarding ophthalmology. Like for example, um, I is always O, uh, and um, if it's right eye, it's uh, O D. If it's left eye, it's O S. If it's both eyes, it's O U. That kind of thing. So we talked about myopia, nearsightedness, hyperopia, farsightedness. Astigmatism is what I mentioned. That you know, if your eyeball, uh, if your cornea and the shape of uh, your cornea and your lens is a little bit off and we could fix that from, uh, with uh, LASIK surgery. Now, let's get to the exams because this is a, um, a specialty uh, class. So of course, the, the uh, first thing that uh, the ophthalmologist will use is an ophthalmoscope. And in lab, I will show you this thing, okay? And basically how to use it and we'll get to play around with it so that you'll have some idea uh, what the ophthalmologist is looking for. And we're also not only looking at vision because we could see inside the patient's eye, we could see also see their vasculature, you know, the arteries and veins. And we can also diagnose hypertension and um, also diabe diabetes uh, from uh, any abnormalities that we see in there. Okay, so that's an ophthalmoscope. Another thing that we use is a tonometer uh, or a tonopen. So a tonometer, maybe you've seen it. It's like, uh, let's see, it's, where is it? That's, the, that's a slit lamp. Well, this is a tonopen, but this is a slit lamp. Where is a tonometer? Oh, here. Right, a tonometer, they, you put your eye on there, right? And it blows like a puff of air. And uh, the puff of air, when it comes back, it detects um, um, the pressures of your eye. The function of a tonometer is to um, screen for uh, glaucoma. Because remember, glaucoma is increased intraocular pressure, which is not good. And here's a Tana pen, right? You put this uh, uh, on your page. Oh, you put it on the patient's eyelid. Uh, back in my day, uh, you got to place it like right here, right in front of their eye. Uh, that was kind of annoying and uh, to our patient. And uh, this thing that I showed you is a slit lamp. The slit lamp takes the, um, um, takes the ophthalmoscope to the next level. It, it has this very concentrated beam of light, much more than the ophthalmoscope. And then we could uh, actually see even to the corners uh, of the inside of the eye even better with a, uh, with a slit lamp. And modern slip lamps now, they're also digital. So we could take pictures of it and share it with colleagues. It's really neat stuff. Oh, looky here. They have a tonometer here. It's a tonometer, you put your chin in here and it, it shoots like a, uh, a puff of air uh, into your eyeball. And the function of the tonometer, of course, is for screening for glaucoma. Okay, so um, we can all, uh, now uh, a refraction examination is if to see if you need corrective lenses. And that's when you have this butterfly thing, right, called a uh, uh, phoropter. Now the phoropter, this has different kinds of lenses and this is when uh, you know, the ophthalmologist says, hey, is it better? Is it worse? Is it good? Because remember, it, both your eyes could have different uh, vision sets. Like for example, I have astigmatism left and it's like horrendous, my, my vision in my left eye. Um, so when my glasses, if ever I get them repaired, um, they, um, the left one is going to be very different than the right. And the phoropter finds, um, um, which, um, which lenses are the best for me for my glasses. And that's, that's where your ophthalmologist um, gets the prescription 
for the optometrist. Now, what's the difference? Ophthalmologist is the MD, deals with diseases and um, uh, can prescribe medications regarding your eye, can also do surgery. But the optometrist, that's the person who measures out your glasses and your, uh, and your um, um, what do you call that, your contacts. And they measure it through this thing called refraction. Refraction, the best way to put it is the bending of light. And um, if you look at like a fishbowl, you know how the fish looks different underwater than it does, you know, in your hand looking at it through air? And that's refraction, okay? It's the bending of light, and that's how the phoropter works. Now, uh, it could... Uh, diagnose distance vision, near vision, and of course we use the Snellens chart, you know, um, uh, um, for that. Um, and if your patient, like if they're a kid, let me show the Snellens chart for a child. Now the normal Snellens chart, that's the one with the different letters, right? Uh, but that's this one, right? It usually starts with an E and then, you know, has all that, but they're different variations. But uh, the one for a child, you could see it has shapes instead of, you know, like square, things that a child would figure out. Or uh, another one is the, they call it the tumbling E. They used to call it the illiterate E, but, and you know, all the patient does is it up, down, left or right. Okay, and that's a Snellen's chart. That's the chart for screening for near or far vision, also known as hyperopia or presbyopia. Oh, by the way, presbyopia is, uh, you know, the vision problems that you'll naturally get um, uh, once you get older. Now, color vision. Color vision are these, uh, these, little, uh, these little books that the ophthalmologist can give you and they have like um, a very mild difference of color. And as you could see here, or maybe you can't see here, maybe, right? Uh, it has numbers, okay? But if you have a color blindness, you won't be able to see the numbers, okay? And that is called an Ishihara color test. And remember these names, they come out, especially in your, um, uh, what do you call that? Your CCMA and that stuff. Snellen's chart, when I took the CCMA a couple years ago, came out. Um, contract sensitivity, eh, not so common. Oh, uh, let's go. Now, let's go to some treatments and some procedures that we do in ophthalmology. So let's look at that. And one, the first thing that we did for our case for uh, Ms. Ramirez in the beginning of the case was eye irrigation. And of course, what do we do? It's when things have to get flushed out. And we flush it, um, uh, we flush it out with um, uh, a specific kind of saline. And saline solution is um, uh, salt water, but it's very, very mild. I'm not going to put tons of salt in your eye. Of course, that will hurt. Right? Um, so... Let's, let's look at sample of eye irrigation. Let's just pick one, see if it's crazy. Equipment required includes the following. The physician's written order, powder-free gloves, a disposable drape, gauze squares, sterile irrigation solution, usually saline or sterile water. All right, let's stop there. See that? Sodium chloride, 0.9%, right? That is the same fluid that runs through our body. That is called NSS, normal saline, and that's what we use. A sterile irrigation bulb syringe, a sterile basin, an infusion set, an IV stand, the required medication, a drainage basin, a towel, biohazard bags, 
While these come in various colors, they can be identified by the universal biohazard symbol. Now, in the ward, these have two entirely different meanings. Uh, um, uh, the yellow uh, usually is for linens and things of that matter. Uh, but the red, that's for um, uh, anything that has any contact to any bodily fluids. And since you're doing eye irrigation, it's contact with your eye that has fluids in it. And of course, remember, the sharps is something then totally different than these two bags. Please check your institution and state regulations to confirm which bag is used and the patient's medical record. Wash and dry your hands. Review the physician's order, noting which eye is to be treated, which medication or solution should be used, and the required dose. Assemble the required equipment. Remove the medication or irrigation solution from storage. And now, did you see something funny about this part of the video? How many people touched that chart, right? She washed her hands but didn't even glove, right? These things, in theory, they're either sterile or really clean. All right, so you shouldn't be touching them with something that you just touched that everyone touched. So uh, you read the, uh, what I like doing is when I was working is on a separate table, I don't put the chart. Uh, and nowadays also you have, everything's electronic medical record. I don't put the chart or um, in a lot of doctor's offices, they have like, a, uh, like an iPad on a stand or something like that. I just put it away uh, from this tray and uh, and the only thing that I have on the tray are the items that I need to do my job. Form the first medication check against the physician's order. Where possible, inspect the solution for any crystals, lumps, or discoloration. Confirm the patient's details. Explain the procedure to the patient. All right. Uh, one also thing, if you recall from your pharmacology, you should check that label at least four times. And what are you checking for? Check for expiration date. Date, excuse me. Check to see if the seals on any of the stuff that was like on the saline bottle and also on all the material that uh, you have, like the irrigation bulb and or those bowls, if they're already in plastic, if the seal was broken. If the seal is broken, you can't use it. If the expiration date is no good you can't use it. If there's any crystals or cloudiness in that saline, right? Or like, just, I, what I do is just shake around the bottle. If I see anything weird, um, I, I bring it to the attention of my chain of command and I don't, I don't use it. And then when you speak to the patient, make sure they know and understand what you're about to do. And of course, garner consent. Check to see if the patient is wearing contact lenses and ask about any known allergies. Obtain consent before proceeding and perform a second medication check. When irrigating the eye, guide the patient into a supine position with their head turned toward the side requiring treatment. Now, why would you do it toward the side of the treatment? Like, why would it matter? Like which side? So if he's having treatment on the right side of his eye, why have him face the right side? Any ideas? Well, let's say I did it backwards and I'm supposed to put the medication here in his left eye. If I did it this way, do you think some of the irrigation, maybe some of the medication that only should be on one eye or some of the dirt or stuff that from the other eye will now go in the unaffected eye. So um, make sure that you know right from your left. Uh, and always it's at the perspective of the patient. So we're looking at our patient right here. This is my patient's right eye. This is my patient's left eye, right? So I assume that the orders were for irrigation right eye and also um, uh, installation of NEDS right eye. So we have the patient lie supine and face their head towards the right. Cover the patient's neck and shoulder with a drape or towel. Place a disposable leak-proof drape next to the affected eye and place... 
Uh, by the way, those are chucks or absorbable, absorbable pads. <laughs> There's no such thing as leak proof. Water is going to, it's going to beat up and it's going to just get all over the place. Uh, so I just put a lot, I like to put a lot of towels and a lot of chucks because uh, it'll get messy, especially in pediatrics. Drainage basin on top of the drain. A seated position is often used for installation of medication into the eye. The supine position may also be used. Okay. Now, in either position, right, when you do it, your, your, your patient might flinch and all of that. So, uh, one of, uh, goes, um, I'll be showing you in lab on uh, uh, ways to brace your patient so that if they flinch, um, you know, uh, they won't move their head so much. Uh, it's not a guarantee. And if you noticed, uh, this bowl here, that's an emesis bowl. That's a typical bowl that um, uh, you, you catch for um, uh, vomiting and stuff, but we use it for other things. Now, that other bowl that they had, that blue one that was here, this is interesting how incomplete this video is. Uh, da, 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 where? See this bowl? Remember this blue bowl? Okay, that's the bowl we put the saline in. And then you take the bulb uh that was this thing and then you aspirate or suck up uh the saline and then uh you pour the saline down and uh let all that fluid trickle into uh the um the emesis bowl or the kidney bowl let me show it right here so you have your patient right and what i like doing is i have the patient focus on something in the room so they're not focusing on me. I asked the patient to look up on the ceiling and, um, hey, can you take a look at that light and just um, kindly stare, for, uh, stare at that light until uh, we're done? And then when I irrigate, I irrigate from the bridge of the nose on down so everything just fall, falls down. And again, the blue bowl is on your uh, table somewhere here. And your, uh, that's why you have the, um, the aspiration bulb. Um, so don't just pour it on his head. Uh, I've done that before as a medical assistant. Uh, you, you're irrigating all these uh, uh, items out. And especially if our patient, uh, like um, um, uh, Miss Valerie Ramirez, the case in the beginning of this chapter, um, there, there, there's going to be things that will uh, end up here if there is a, a foreign body. So that's what the ophthalmologist will be looking for when they ask you, oh, can you kindly do an initial irrigation? You not only how you have to report how, um, you also have to document how all of this went down. Okay, was there any blood? Uh, um, did the patient fe feel pain? Uh, things that, and things of that matter. And the stream of uh, the fluid, the way you, the way you irrigate here, you know, don't, you know, don't really really spray it. Like try, uh, try to keep the pressure on the bulb not so much. Again, it's hard to explain this stuff through a video and. Uh, through online, but we will be uh, going over this uh, when we get to lab, okay? So let's go to ear. And uh, that irrigation process also works with, uh, works with the ear. And I don't like having the patient lie down. I like having the patient sit up a little bit more and, and have the emesis bowl uh, near their neck. And it's the reason why it's kidney shaped. It can shape around your neck, which is really neat. Okay, so now let's uh, look into the wonderful world of otorhinolaryngology, also known as ENT. And again, I'm just going to breeze through the common disorders of the ear. Um, look at, uh, uh, I also put this in the notes as well. This is uh, typical uh, anatomy and physiology. You have your uh, tympanic membrane or eardrum, the ossicles within the middle ear, and then you have the inner ear, the really important stuff which is um, you have your semicircular canals for balance and you have your cochlea uh, for hearing and your uh, cranial nerve eight, which is your vestibulocochlear nerve. So that nerve is good for balance and for hearing. Now, the things that we're most concerned out, uh, about, especially in an outpatient setting, is anything that will uh, mess with uh, the middle ear going on to the inner ear. The external ear, eh, you know, you rip that out and it, 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 um, 
So if there's no real function of the pinna, also known as the oracle. It's, it's nice when to hang jewelry off of and to put your glasses on, but we're more concerned of things that are going on here. Because if this gets inflamed or infected or your tympanic membrane gets ruptured, you won't be able to transfer um, uh, sound through these uh, ossicles, which are the smallest bones in your body, into your oval window and into your cochlea. It'll be a problem. You also have your eustachian tube right here. That's the tube that's connected to your um, nasopharynx, and that's the thing that goes pop, you know, when you go up in the airplane. And it does that so there will be a um, pressure stabilization between your nasopharynx and uh, your middle and your inner ear. And that's why also, you know, when you go up in an airplane, get a little bit dizzy because it has some, the pressure effects has some effects on your, uh, your um, semicircular canals, which are, which function for balance. So when you look at that, things, things that we're looking at is ceramin, because normally there's some wax in here and its function is to uh, trap foreign body uh, and anything that gets in there, bugs or whatnot. Yes, bugs, sometimes they get in there, all right? Um, I had a roach problem in my apartment uh, in New York City. I used to always sleep with um, earplugs because I had a patient where uh, a family of cockroaches got stuck up in here. So any sermon impaction and a uh, foreign body, and it will affect hearing. Now, like I said, uh, if you have a titus ex externa, inflammation infection of your uh, outer ear here, yeah, we're concerned about it. We're more concerned about it going where? In here, okay? Because the middle and inner ear are very, very important, and you can see they're very protected. So the common disorders of the middle ear, like otitis media, uh, that's very common, especially if you have children around. So look for the history of the patient or the child has a sore throat, nasopharynx. The... Um, uh, the bacteria climbed up here, and now they have an earache or some discharge. Be very, very mindful of what color, smell, odor is also important regarding discharge. So if there's anything coming to the ears, like blood or uh, pus. Mastoiditis, your mastoid process is uh, somewhere here. Where is it? And they're not going to show it. Um, it's uh, If you feel on the back of your ear, there's a bone sticking out there. Uh, you could also have mastoiditis, which also could lead to some problems. Autosclerosis. Um, sometimes uh, the bones here, your ossicles, uh, get hardened up. And if they, these harden up and they're not light and small, your tympanic membrane won't be able to transfer the vibrations of sound into your oval window, which is right here, into your cochlea, so you won't be able to hear very well. And that's uh, autosclerosis uh, is very common uh, um, in um, more elderly patients. Uh, also, um, a common symptom of inner ear damage is tinnitus. If any of you ever been to a concert or a loud place, and then you go home, and you hear that ringing like, ee, you know, in your ear. I've been a DJ for 30 years. I have that in my left ear forever um, uh, because of all the times I've, I've put in, uh, headphones in my left ear only and my monitor speaker is always on my left side. Uh, so you have uh, uh, issues there. Now, this is otitis media or, uh, and you could see, it's really common and especially with kids, okay? Um, um, because it leads uh, to bacteria uh, going in your eustachian tube. Okay, so think of flu-like symptoms and then the kid starts having um, uh, uh, some ear problems or you have some ear problems. That's also, for those of you who have children, you know your kids never get sick, but you always get sick. I can't even count how many times I've had otitis media because of my kids. Ruptured eardrum or a ruptured tympanic membrane, that's of concern. Labyrinthitis, now all these things of the inner ear, labyrinthitis, mini ears, presbycusis, right? All of these, you're gonna have 
not only hearing problems, but you're also going to have uh, balance problems. Because remember, your uh, inner ear and also your vestibular cochlear nerve deals with not one, but two things, balance and hearing. So a lot of times it goes together. And uh, presbycusis, right? Uh, that's when, you know, just the natural hearing loss of when you get older. Uh, because, uh, you know, when you get older, you get exposed, especially if you had a job uh, that required for you to wear ear protection. Um, I used to never wear ear protection when I did things around the house nowadays. Uh, because my hearing in my left ear is, I think, I don't know, 30% lower than my right. And my right isn't even that good. Now, your hearing loss could be of two types, okay? It could be of conductive hearing loss or sensory neural hearing loss. So with conducting hearing loss, there's something wrong with the transmission of sound waves, okay? So if there's an obstruction or something in the way in the uh, um, uh, middle canal or your auditory canal in your middle ear, an autosclerosis, and, which is reduced movement of your ossicles, right? That's conductive hearing loss. Now, sensory neural hearing loss is that there's damage to the inner ear, okay? It could be hereditary, it could be neurologic, but it's more of the nervous system, uh, a nervous system problem and a problem with your cranial nerve eight, which is your vestibular cochlear nerve. Mm, let's see, oh, tuning fork. Um, that's one way we can um, uh, uh, do some hearing test. Uh, one of them is called uh, the Rene Weber test, right? And, and uh, here's the Rene test right here, Weber test down here. So this, this is the job that the MD does, but you know, in lab, we could play around with it. So you, uh, I have a couple of tuning forks. So um, you make a sound and then you, uh, uh, you put the, um, um, uh, the tuning fork, uh, uh, what do you call that? Um, you know, in the middle, uh, in the middle of your head. Um, and then you ask, is it, is it coming from the right or the left? And if it's, uh, um, if it's coming from uh, one side versus the other, there could be potential hearing loss. Um, and the Rene test, um, how long does it take for the person to uh, hear the sound uh, from a tuning fork when they place it on the mastoid bone? Again, that's that bone that's sticking out in the back of your ear. If you can feel the back of your, your ear, there's like a little bone back there. Or you could, uh, if you're in a false church campus, they have an audiometer. It's actual a, um, um, it's an actual machine that measures uh, at which frequencies you can hear. And remember, that's kind of like if you recall. Oh, here you go, Renee Weber test. See, nice little thing here. And um, uh, audiometry is um, it's that little machine and then they put the headphones on and uh, they, the, the technician has varying um, uh, sounds and you raise your right hand, raise your left hand or raise both of your hands if you recall that from grade school. Uh, tympanometry is um, uh, again, uh, you, we stick it in your ear. Why am I just trying to explain it? Let's show you it. We stick this machine in your ear and then it sends pulses out and it comes back with a chart and the chart can tell me things about your hearing and that's all that is and how your um your tympanic membrane which is your eardrum how well does it um um transfer sound waves onto your ossicles or the smallest bones in your body that's tympan. That's a tympanometry. Now, what's audiometry? Right. They 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 have uh they have these uh, same thing. They have uh something that you can see here. They put this uh this headphone in your ear, and then they ask you a set of questions, 
and then from the set of questions and from when you reacted, it can come up, a, it has a chart and it tells what frequencies you can hear and you can't hear. And they can diagnose things from that. All right, so you could be asked, if you're in that office, you could be asked to help out with those things. Iraqs and foreign body removal and uh, putting uh, medications. Let's look at some ear, uh, uh, let's look at ear irrigation. And you could see it has similar, it has uh, similar properties as um, as the eye irrigation. Okay, let's stop. Now, otoscope, of course, that's different than an ophthalmoscope. It's for your eyes. The tips. Now, the tips, uh, many places they just uh, dispose of the tips, but there are also a lot of doctor's offices that they put the tips in um, a disinfectant and then they scrub them out and they, they reuse them, which is acceptable. But many other places, they just throw them out. Um, uh, now, we don't use like normal tissues because... It has these little fibers and stuff like this. A laboratory, there's something called Kim wipes, and they're tissues that don't have the fibers that, that easily come apart. And of course, a clean towel and white. I hope this is white and not gray. Gloves, and uh, again, a little mini bowl, a kidney dish, also known as an emesis bowl. But this is uh, specifically made uh, to pour out things. And of course, you have your your syringes with no needle, um, and again, um, uh, disposable as well. Hi, my name is Gishan. Uh, what's your name? James. Hi, James. I'd like to wash your ear out today. Is that all right? That's fine. Okay. First of all, I need to look inside your ear. Okay. Um, do you have any allergies? And just to make a side note, looking inside the patient's ear, that's the, that's the ophthalmologist's job. Uh, but uh, again, we introduce it to you so you know exactly what they're doing. Or if the patient asks, hey, what's that thing right there? Like, because it, you know, a uh, patient could be nervous about that. Actually, do not wash out or anything. Remember, just like the um, eye irrigation, you must have orders, right? Uh, you just don't do it because, hmm, my patient says my ear is scratchy. You don't just do this on your own. And typically, the, uh, the solution is either uh, 0 0.9 percent sodium chloride or NSS, uh, um, and also if it's impacted ceramin, we like using um, uh, um, a one-to-one -one mixture of sodium hydroxide. And I don't use a needle, for heaven's sakes. Uh, but we also have like these plastic uh, needles that are on the top, and I don't know why they have to tap out. I guess it's just habit, because it really wouldn't matter if you have bubbles in it or not. Okay, you're just testing the syringe, it's a good idea. See how this thing is just sitting out here? If that's a needle, put it in your sharps immediately. So most likely there's probably an infection or a wound. So we're gonna use, uh, 10% providine iodine solution.
Okay, I'm going to place this over your shoulder. And can I ask you to hold this under your ear? I even place it higher. All the way up to here. Okay. And also I cover their mouth because sometimes some of this stuff drips out. Ugh. You don't want that stuff to end up in your patient's mouth. And I also like putting them a little bit back, like lay back uh, a little bit uh, in the chair so that um, uh, you can see here, right? I like putting this thing right up underneath here. So it bypasses his mouth and I cover the mouth, uh, the mouth area as well. Now, of course, um, that's called wicking. Uh, you don't do that, okay? And of course, you put it in biohazard because it got exposed to the inner mucosal lining of my patient. And you see there, he was very, very polite and only just used a little, little. When you irrigate, we use a lot. Like I'll flush that thing out with 100 cc's plus and I'll keep on doing it until things come out. And also another thing that you do after you inspect is, after you do that, you take a good look at the contents that came out. And uh, you got a cell phone, take a picture of it or properly describe it. Was it impacted ceremony? Uh, uh, um, uh, was it blood? Uh, was it clear fluid? Did the fluid smell? Or did the, um, did the uh, items that were removed, um, um, uh, what do you call that? Um, the items removed, uh, did it have a certain color or certain consistency? Uh, and also, um, did the patient tolerate it well? Watch your patient because remember, you're flushing things out, you're messing with potentially the middle to inner ear, right? Uh, I mean, not really the inner ear, but you know, you wanna see how the patient reacts to it. Because I've had patients, you know, because of the smell and what came out of their ear, they start vomiting. And that's a nice thing having an emesis bowl. So some of the, uh, the takeaways of this is that your function, it goes, is to uh, really irrigate that stuff uh, through and through. You see, you see there in this demonstration, they just did a little bit, a little bit, now you, you load up on one, uh, like 100 cc's and you really flush it and until there's like, un until it really, really uh, floods that ear. Um, and then I always end up, if I put sodium hydroxide or um, iodine in it, I always end up uh, doing one flush of NSS uh, just to get all that stuff out. All righty. And that is how to do uh, um, uh, ear irrigation and uh, hearing aids. Uh, I remember the technician and the people who uh, make and um, deal with the hearing aids, they're called audiologists. You also can have a cochlear implant because remember, it is the vestibulocochlear nerve. Um, uh, sometimes they have like a little plate like around here near the upper to the back part of their ear, and uh, that helps them uh, hear. And, oh, here's the very, very end. So at the end of every chapter, and definitely in the blue part, they have all the procedures. So look at all the procedures at the very end, and we'll be going over these as well in lab, how to perform a vision test, right? And it's, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, how to do an Ishihara, right? Um, how to do uh, eye and ear uh, cream uh, eardrops and eye drops. And remember, all the stuff that you learned in MED 140, Pharmacology 1, apply. And how to perform eye uh, irrigation and measuring auditory acuity and the rarity you'll be doing that, but never know. Okay, but definitely you'll be doing uh, eardrops, eye drops, and also. Um, 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 irrigations as well. That's a very, very common thing. All right. So with that said, kindly take a look at your notes and follow along with the video. I, like, let's see if I missed anything from my notes. 
So we covered some disorders of the eye, went, along, uh, went over this picture, right? The difference between normal vision and farsightedness and nearsightedness. Uh, slit lamp, tonometer, ophthalmoscope, uh, phoropter, went over that. Ooh, we didn't go over, eh, Pelly Robeson, contrast sensitivity, you know, de depending, eh, and Jaeger chart, nice to know, but you definitely have to know Ishihara's and Snellen's, that always comes out. Um, eye medications, ear irrigations, yep, we went over that. Tinnitus, hearing tests, okay, here's a, here's a, why did I, well, this is the range of normal speech. Uh, you should be able to hear it around 60 decibels. Uh, but, you know, you go to a club, bar, easily 100, 110. Uh, very, very loud. Okay. Um, and that's why nowadays a lot of cell phones and all headphones have, um, uh, what do you call it? Noise reduction or uh, sound reduction. Here's, I don't know why I put that, but this definitely you need to know, right? Uh, just a quick review of your anatomy and physiology. All right, other than that, it looks like we, uh, and these notes are, um, are included already embedded into your um, Moodle course shell. And remember, uh, grades are due this week. So kindly finish up as much as you can before Saturday. And remember your midterm grade uh, is uh, is just that. It's not the official official grade yet. It's uh, just an estimate of where you are so far in the term. So what's due today? All topic four stuff. So that's um, uh, your discussion and your quiz. And what's due for next week? And try to get some of it done. Discussion five and quiz five. Okay. And I'll be putting up this recording uh, shortly. So is there any questions, comments, recipes? If not, uh, have a good day. Hello? Yeah. Uh, I had a question about the quiz. Okay. Um, you said we can do it again, right? Just yeah, in case so, we score a Yeah, so let's say, because some of you have like a score of 60 and 70, uh, um, uh, take it again. And uh, try to get a better score. Try to, or keep on taking it until you get a hundred, right? Um, but right. this quiz five, um, uh, this quiz six, these were done in class probably, so that's probably why I put it. This one, uh, you email me it, uh, the answers. Oh, okay. Uh, and do that by, and try to do this stuff by. You can, you guys can do this. Do this stuff by, by Saturday, so I, we can get uh, complete. Time. Because if you only have up to week four stuff, I can only grade you up to week four. And that's not like a, you know, uh, uh, you might fall short 10% of, uh, you know, of a good estimate of where you are in the course. But I don't think anyone's failing. I think you guys are doing fine. Uh, but just remember to uh, catch up on these. All right? All right. Thank you. If nothing else, uh, remember to uh, email me uh, regarding confirmation regarding uh, those laboratory schedules, because we have to make sure that there's a minimal amount of people on campus at any given time. Uh, okay, because even though uh, only culinary, nursing, and health science will be on campus, only for laboratories, but, you know, we're trying to make sure that not all of us are on campus all at the same time. Okay? Okay.